Really quick to fans of Boundary Break, this is a one-off video. This is not a new direction for the channel. So if this is not a video you're interested in, just stay tuned in about a week and you'll get a new Boundary Break episode, which will be a lot more consistent than content like this. But uh, if you really want some Boundary Breaking stuff, I can make it somewhat relevant to this video. I guess in the original Street Fighter 2, there were some chains that were supposed to be a front layer and it was supposed to look like a foreground element, but the developers thought, uh, it covers up the sprites and you kind of need that to see the action and react to stuff, so maybe we should get rid of this. Instead of removing it completely, they decided to move it from the top layer all the way to the very last layer. And if you remove all the layers in the game, you can see a little bit of this artifact right here. Anyways, enjoy the video. So for the longest time, I've always wanted an arcade in my own home. Now that predates the 1UP arcades by a long shot, and I've always wondered what arcade I would have in my own house. Now what immediately always used to come to my mind was like the Simpsons arcade or the Ninja Turtles arcade, but the steep steep prices of authentic arcades just completely steered me away from certain options. It also made me use my logic brain, like how often would I be using this machine, uh, what purpose would it serve for me if I was to own it at all times. And then a company called 1UP started putting out miniature arcades and uh, they have a couple of fighting game arcades and that's the genre I decided to go with for a couple reasons I'll mention later in the video. And the three options I know of currently are Street Fighter 2, the Mortal Kombat trilogy, and the Marvel superhero games. Those are three very solid options but I decided to go with Street Fighter for a couple of reasons. One, I became more of a Street Fighter fan than a Mortal Kombat fan over the years. And taking my skill from the Street Fighter 2 arcade is a lot more applicable and more likely than being able to find, say, Children of the Atom out in the wild. And so with that in mind, the hunt began. I remember seeing it at Walmart for 250 bucks, and I was thinking to myself, eh, I'll wait till next week, or mm, maybe I'll wait till the price just drops just a little bit more. And then it left the store, and then I was like, oh, that was a big mistake, let me buy it online then. And then I found out that they charge much higher prices online, so I felt like a big dummy. And then thankfully, two weeks down the road, it looks like whoever put that thing on layaway put it back on the store shelf and I was able to pick it up for 50 bucks less, thank you very much. So I have a Street Fighter 2 arcade here for $200. Pretty cool stuff. Now I didn't know how much I'd be using this thing, but that's part of the journey and that's part of what this video is all about. So I got this thing built, it looks swanky in my office, I like it. I never found the high riser at a price that I found appropriate because it's just a piece of wood. So instead I left it as is and just got it a little office chair and put it to the lowest setting and I just sit at my little arcade. You actually do get used to that over time. I do recommend you don't get the high riser. It's You're just being ripped off. An office chair really does just work fine. Now by the time I got this thing there was the pandemic going on. No friends could come over to play with me. And honestly, even if I did get friends to come over, um, I'd probably womp them pretty bad because I have the advantage of having this thing at home. And you would think, oh shoot, buying this thing was a total waste then, wasn't it? No, not at all actually. I no doubt have invested over 100 hours into this machine. And let me tell you why. First of all, I want to say that I've never quite understood why there were so many versions of Street Fighter 2. Seeing how many iterations there were available before they finally moved on to a different entry was mind-boggling to me. And the only differences I knew off the top of my head at the time was that one version allows you to play as the bosses, and another version allows you to play as Cammy, Fei Long, T-Hawk, and DJ. Now that makes up at least three different versions, and I still didn't quite understand what made up all the other differences. If you're not being introduced characters, what's the point? Well, keep that in the back of your mind as I talk about this journey with the Street Fighter 2 arcade for 1UP. But for now, let's reintroduce what was the core reason why I even bought this thing. I've been terrible at playing fighting games with a arcade stick. No matter how good I was at home with Street Fighter 4 on my Xbox 360 controller, I couldn't reapply most of that skill to whatever arcade I went to out in the real world. And it was kind of frustrating. I knew I was good at Street Fighter to a certain degree, but I couldn't show that to anybody. I remember distinctly there was a Red Bull party at PAX East, and there was this one kid that was just whomping me at Street Fighter 2, and I couldn't believe it. And while I'm not a sore sport by any means, I did feel pretty frustrated in the fact that I couldn't pull off something as simple as Hadouken on command. And so here's my first goal. Get the controls down so that I can at least do a Hadouken and a Shoyuken on command. I thought I'd be able to do this just against the PC. Um, no, the PC will ruin you in this game. It is insanely tough. So I had to come up with a plan. And the plan was, since there's no training mode, I just put in a second player and I would beat on a second player manned by nobody. 
That was my training mode. And for a good while, I was trying to use it on the left stick. As I was trying to do it with the left stick, I was just doing really terrible with it. And then I moved over to the right stick. And for some reason, the right stick was working really well for me at the time. So, you know what? I'll just stick with the right stick. It's a little bit of a hassle. You have to beat out the first player before you can start playing as second player. But why not? So anyways, I learned how to do a Hadouken pretty well at least. The Shoryuken was still a little bit difficult for me. I still just, I mean, I could get it down about maybe 40% of the time at the point of this story. And so I took that skill over into the single player campaign. And I realized with Super Turbo, it's just too fast for me. That's at least what I thought was the problem. And so I was like, you know what? There's three different versions of Street Fighter here. Why don't I just start with the one in the middle? Because I don't want to go with the earliest one. Why would I want something that's really old when I can go with the one that's like somewhere in the middle? And so Super Street Fighter 2, the new Challengers, was the version of my choice, which is something I did not expect to happen when buying this machine. I thought that that was very redundant at the time. It's like, why don't you just give me the best version? Well, already I found that somewhere down the middle was more tailored to me. And so I started picking my boy Ken, and uh, I was still having a pretty hard time honestly because I was simply trying to execute a good counter move and not getting that out properly and so I was getting hit instead. Of course my solution to that was not to master the Shoryuken. Oh no, of course not. I decided why don't I use a character that doesn't require such difficult movement patterns in order to pull off a move. And so I started experimenting a little bit with each character and there was two characters that seemed a lot easier to manage with. One was Dalsim, who without having to do any of his special moves, aside from maybe the Hadouken ripoff, the Yoga Fire, which is just as easy to pull off as a Hadouken, I managed to keep some of these defensive heavy PCs at bay with Dalsim's superior defensive capabilities. And then there were some NPCs that were just a little too much to handle for Dalsim. Typically, those ones would be the ones with their own fireballs. And so what I would do is I would hit continue and swap over to T-Hawk. Now, T-Hawk had a little bit of an advantage over fireball users because if you just hit all three punch buttons up in the air, He'll dive across the screen and hit the character. And if the opponent is in the middle of throwing a fireball, T-Hawk's going to be able to hit the opponent before they can end that animation cycle. Perfect. We found a move that is easy to pull off and is also able to counter something that NPCs seem to just do ad nauseum, which is just be defensive as hell and throw out these stupid fireballs. And so I finally found my exploit and my first win in Street Fighter 2 Arcade was with T-Hawk. Spamming those dive bombs did wonders for me, but I wasn't finished there. T-Hawk is great and all, but he's not my favorite character out of the game. It still feels like I didn't really quite accomplish what I set out to do, which is to master the controls for other characters. And so what I ended up doing was I started using the Shoto characters a lot more. Ken, Ryu, and Sagat. Especially Sagat, I love Sagat a lot. But I started to realize that Sagat had a little bit of a disadvantage that I've never quite really realized before. See, he can do tiger shots above and below, and that means he can't do anything in the middle. And that became problematic against certain characters. And so I was like, yeah, you know, maybe maybe he isn't quite as versatile as I thought against NPCs at least, who can kind of read your button inputs. So I decided to move back to Ken. And slowly over time, I went back to the left hand stick as well. Finally mastering Hadoukens and Shoyukens from the left side going right. And around this time, I probably had about 10 hours of play time on this machine. And I'd say that the rate in which I could do Shoryukens was about half the time. I have to say, every time I could land a Shoryuken effectively, it was immensely satisfying. You get that extra damage, you knew exactly what your opponent was going to do, and you punish them hard for it. That's the level of satisfaction that I want when I'm playing Street Fighter. I don't wanna feel like I'm just smacking buttons and winning by luck or chance. And honestly, one detail that I kinda left out that made me a better player overall was that because I couldn't do a Shoryuken, I started to discover that there's characters that have basic moves that function somewhat like a Shoryuken. Like for example, Dalsim's medium kick does a pretty good job at this, as well as Sagat's heavy kick. I almost never use Sagat's tiger uppercut because I'm still not 100% consistent with it, but that kick always will be. So why not just use the kick? Characters like Ryu and Ken are a little bit less effective with that. And I already mentioned before, Sagat isn't really my favorite Shoto when it comes to Hadoukens, or in his case, Tiger Shots. So I went back to using Ken, and by a force of my own hand, I eventually, finally, got that rhythm just right, that movement pattern that you need, that delicate, delicate movement pattern, to finally do the Shoyuken pretty effectively. It's still not 100%, it's better than 50% though, it's probably now, after using the character so much, 
I'd say about 70% of the time, which is still not amazing because when that 30% hits you, it hits you hard. These NPCs are brutal and you have to have a lot of patience to finally win over these NPCs. Maybe you're an incredible Street Fighter player and you're watching this video right now and you're laughing at me, but just know I'm not a pro player. I'm a very average player and I'm an average player that wins out over most of my friends who play against me in Street Fighter. So, you know, I have like a slightly above average skill level and for anybody that can relate to that skill level, yeah, I'm telling you right now, the NPCs in Street Fighter 2 across the board are very, very difficult. But anyways, with that said, I got to win out with Ken and Sagat on Super Street Fighter 2 the new challengers, bringing my total amount of character wins to four at this point. And it was at this point that I was getting curious. I was like, you know what? I've been playing this version of Street Fighter 2 for a while. Maybe I can finally take this over to Super Street Fighter 2 Turbo and not only introduce my new skills to the higher speed, but also get a chance to see some of the differences made between the two versions. And now that I've really kind of stopped to appreciate Street Fighter 2 Turbo, I still don't like it. Uh, one, it's too fast, which I know is a weird complaint because when I looked back on Street Fighter 2 playing stuff like Street Fighter 4, Street Fighter 5, I found Street Fighter 2 to be painfully slow. But with how difficult these NPCs are, you want that slow speed because you need time to react. And I won't spoil anything, but just know that at this point in my play session, I got whomped and I didn't even know why. I thought simply it was just too fast. and. To be fair, it kind of still was. And I also just didn't like the fact that it was incredibly difficult to get the original colors. I don't know why it's like this, but you have to put in like a secret password just to play as the characters in their original colors and forget about playing as Akuma. I saw a tutorial online on how you're supposed to do that. No way, man. I tried several times, I couldn't get it to happen. And it's not even worth it because once you lose with Akuma, you have to do the password all over again, which is already too difficult. And so after being thoroughly handed by the CPU, I went back and I looked at what was left. There was the older, older version of Street Fighter 2. This one is called Street Fighter 2 Champion Edition. And I was like, you know what? Why not? Let's just check it out. And this was a revelation that was really cool to me. I found out that there are a lot of differences between Champion Edition and Super Street Fighter 2 The New Challengers. And that's not to say just the four characters. The character portraits, the music, the intro, it's all vastly different. And switching between the two just to see the different dialogue and different character portraits was fine enough, honestly. It mixed it up just enough that it kept me interested and it kept me going. And also, without T-Hawk in the mix, it put a force on my back to get even better. And also just experiment with some of the characters that were not the new four. I started getting pretty good with the charge characters on a level that I never had before. And again, because the Shoryuken isn't available to every character, I started experimenting with what moves would substitute for a Shoryuken. And so I found viability in characters like Blanca by finding certain moves that will definitely hit a character that jumps at you. Honestly, it was a pretty good time and you know spotting all the differences was a ton of fun too like for example you look at balrog here when he wins the screen he's got blue eyes what and i thought like wow I, I didn't know that balrog had blue eyes in the original game but what's fun is that you realize that the developers themselves noticed this and made a change to him in the very next game if you go back to the new challengers you can see that his face is completely different now and that's something i would have never noticed if i just had one copy one version of street fighter 2. i would have just assumed whatever version i had was just how balrog always looked but because i had an immediate access to both versions to compare it side by side it was much easier to spot what was different and those differences don't even end there i mean like if you look at the background of ken stage you can see a guy in a trench coat that doesn't even look human and a Apparently, that's the inspiration for the character Q. But what's really cool is that if you go into the next game, the developers also realize that these characters didn't look human and change the look of the background drastically to accommodate that. And so now the inspiration for Q is gone. So he's not even in every version of Street Fighter 2. I don't know, I just find all this really cool and fascinating. And it really added to the value of this machine that I didn't think would be this interesting. And I certainly never thought that I would enjoy it on this level. Just beating the game in general? Come on, I thought I'd be done with this by the end of the first night. But no, putting in tons and tons of time, getting slightly better and better and better, just to win out over these incredibly cheap CPUs, became the big goal of mine. Anyways, many, many days pass. I'm playing this game all the time because it's so accessible. I don't even have to think about it. When I get bored or I need a moment to stop editing videos, I can just walk over to this machine, flip the on switch, 
and just look at something a little bit different than my computer screen. And due to that accessibility, I become a much better player since. And you would think that now, after all this training, after all this understanding of how the CPUs work, I could finally take this skill over to at least Turbo and finally win the game. Well, I can tell you right now, as of recording this video, I have not done that. I still cannot beat Turbo. And now I can tell you why. It's because the CPUs in Turbo are even harder than the CPUs in any of the other two versions that you have available to you. It's not about the speed. No, it's just that the CPU in Street Fighter 2 Turbo is just way too freaking smart. Whereas the CPUs in the earlier games are just mostly defensive and wait for you to mess up, you can kind of bait them into doing a little bit of offense and then punish them. <laughs> but in Turbo, they mix it up quite a bit and they read you pretty fast. So like if you decide you want to try to bait them into some offense, it seems like they recognize that in their programming and then go on the offense and really mess you up. And it's at this point that you really need a 100% hit rate on your Shoyukens. And I'm telling you, I still haven't done it. Like I said, I got about a 70% rate and if it does not go off, oh my goodness, the amount of damage I will take from this CPU. And again, I have to do this multiple times. It can't just be one CPU. And I have to do it in one go. I have to keep continuing until I win, which has gone completely against my comfort of play up to this point. See, the detail I haven't shared with you guys is that my comfort of play when using this arcade is that I'll just do a couple matches and if I lose maybe two, three times in a row, yeah, I'll just turn it off. It's not out of frustration. It's just that, no, I had my fun. And honestly, I'm just talking this all out with you guys, and I'm realizing that's a really cheap way to end out this video, isn't it? I really probably should have a more ceremonious end to this whole story, this tale. And you know what? I am. I'm gonna do it. And I'm gonna record the whole thing here for you right now. I don't know how much video footage this is gonna take. I'm going to do this. I am determined to take one win off of this version of the game to give this a ceremonious end. All right, let's do it. All right, I'm just gonna mention a couple things here as the footage plays out. Uh, first of all, you're gonna notice that the quality of the footage is a lot worse. That's because I'm now playing off the arcade exclusively. That's the whole point of this challenge. And I do apologize for how the footage looks at the start here. I do quickly correct the camera angling. At a certain point, I start playing the game with the camera basically right up against my face. I have to like peek over it in order to play the game. Thankfully, it was only distracting for a couple minutes and then all of a sudden I got used to it. Also, after the Dolce match, which I managed to beat after my first try, you're gonna notice that I'm only recording footage when I get a win in one of the rounds. Uh, this is because I have a really crappy camera. It overheats very quickly and its battery drains very quickly as well. So conserving both of those things, making it possible to collect all this footage, I had to stop recording in between certain rounds just to get to a certain point. And you'll see that that was very necessary. Uh, like for example here with DJ as I was speaking here, uh, he took a lot of wins on me. Now he was match two to start with because he was the second opponent. But as you're going to see as I top off this footage that I decided to highlight here about him, I didn't win against him until I was 17 matches in. See, there's this little counter right here that does tell you how many matches you've played, including the ones that you've lost. So we're going to keep track of that and talk about that as we keep going along because the number gets pretty interesting. Oh my god, it finally happened! I was taking quite a few losses with Guile as well. I ended up losing 10 times in a row to him. But it was around this time that I started to realize that standing moves were pretty effective against this CPU for some reason. I'm very used to trying to catch the opponent off guard with a sweep or something, or some kind of low attack. That usually works very well against human players, but the CPU is very, very smart about that, but surprisingly dumb about standing moves. And don't get me wrong, this isn't a full exploit. The CPU can still very much block those attacks and very much counter those attacks as well. But mixing it up quite a bit seemed to throw them off. Whew. Moving on quickly, that's good. Uh, well, Honda's not bad. Japan. <laughs> no. No. Oh, <laughs> 
Here we go. Uh, come on. Yes. That was easy. So thankfully, it didn't take too long to get through the center part of this game because I was getting paired up with a lot of characters that have a disadvantage against Shadow characters like E Honda, Fei Long, and Zungif. It, it honestly wasn't nearly as painful as something like DJ. Zungif here only took three matches, and at this point in time, there were 38 battles in total. <laughs> The next two are T-Hawk and Balrog, both characters that are also not horrendous to fight against when they're CPUs at least. Because although I was mentioning earlier in the video that you can use T-Hawk's dive bomb to kind of punish fireballs, the CPU is not really good at that. Uh, it seems like it has like a quota in which it needs to throw out a certain amount of special moves just to show off that it's a little bit better than you. But in the case of T-Hawk, you have to be very careful about when you throw out those dive bombs because those themselves can be pretty punishable. And then Balrog just doesn't really have any great options against fireballs. And using his special moves from across the stage is very telling. Now again, these opponents were still very tough. You couldn't sleep on them by any means, but their core disadvantage certainly gave me an edge that allowed me to move on past these opponents pretty quickly. Now it's here where I have to be very selective about which footage audio I let you guys listen to because this is where I get drained. The Shadowloo bosses were particularly difficult and at this point I was on the machine for hours with no rest. I definitely didn't think that it would be going on for this long. I didn't think I'd be taking this many losses. And honestly, my soul started to get shattered. I couldn't feel more in the zone, and yet even with all of my skill being applied to these bosses, it just took a lot of trial and error. Goodness. Come on, no. Ah, I did it. Oh. Holy crap. Yikes. Oh my god. Yeah. Uh, oh no. No. Oh man. Yeah! Yeah! Oh no! Yeah! One more to go! Now once again, keep in mind the battle counter. It took 62 matches to get up to M. Bison. And honestly, I was not prepared for what was going to happen next. Oh my god, you got a perfect! Oh man. Oh my god, that was a disaster! Damn! No way. <laughs> There's no way. I'm gonna get up to 99, aren't I? He'll keep landing into my aerial kicks. Oh! No! Yes! 
Come on. No. What the f was that? No. What? So at this point, uh, as you can see here, I managed to reach 99 matches and it just stops counting after that. I'd say that I tried probably another 30 times, so in total maybe about 130 matches before I finally had to throw in the towel. It just was getting too late. I was mentally exhausted and my body was just saying none of this is healthy for you right now, you have to stop. You'll also notice that with the last bit of footage here, there's something obscuring the camera. That's because I ran out of battery power on my professional camera. So what you're looking at here is footage off of my phone. And uh, yeah, there wasn't too many matches after that, and I had to give up. As much as I really didn't want to disappoint everybody, it just had to happen. But oh my goodness, was that quite a journey. So anyways, in conclusion, uh, do I regret spending $200 to have Street Fighter 2 available in my home at all times on an arcade stick? No, absolutely not. I have without a doubt validated the purchase of this thing even if I never touch it ever again. There was so much that I've learned, there's so much that I've appreciated, and there's so much skill that I've gained from owning this machine. And I cannot wait to eventually take this skill out into the real world where some arcades still have Street Fighter 2 to this day. And if you are like me and you're not collecting all the 1UP arcades as they come out and you need one choice, I do recommend that you either pick up this machine or the Mortal Kombat machine. Because even if you don't have a friend that comes over all the time to play the game with you, I will say, much to my surprise, there is a lot more fun to be had on this machine than you might think. Thank you so much for watching. And I really hope that you enjoyed watching this little side video as much as I did making it. Take care.